It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Before we get started, I wanted to take a second to thank you for listening to another episode. I put a lot of work into the show, and I hope you get a lot out of it. If you do, all I ask is for you to help me share the show by spamming all of your friends, family, and perhaps uh, even your mortal enemies, if you want. You can post a link to a favorite episode on Facebook, or tweet about the show. You can talk directly to friends who you think might actually be interested in it, or you can rate and review the show in iTunes. You can leave comments on the Maxwell Institute's YouTube channel. I read every review and every comment, and I really appreciate everyone that comes in, so thank you. This episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast differs from most. It's a recording of a panel discussion that was held to celebrate the publication of Stephen Peck's new book, Evolving Faith, Wanderings of a Mormon Biologist. Evolving Faith was released by the Maxwell Institute on October 27th, and on that day, three panelists discussed the book at Provo's Writ and Vision Book and Art Gallery. Evolving Faith is available at local LDS bookstores in Utah. You can get copies at Deseret Book or on Amazon. And you can read more about Evolving Faith at bit.ly slash evolvingfaith. As always, you can send me questions, comments, and suggestions about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast by emailing mipodcast at byu.edu. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I want to say thanks to everybody for coming tonight um, to this great release event for Stephen Peck's, uh, another one of Stephen Peck's books. How many of you have been to a Stephen Peck event in the last couple of months here? <laughs> Getting to be quite regular. <laughs> um, I'm Blair Hodges. I'm with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. Uh, you may remember me from such podcasts as the Neil A. Maxwell Institute podcast. Um, but uh, this, this book is part of the Maxwell Institute's Living Faith book series. And uh, each book in the series is written by a Latter-day Saint scholar who models faithful and, and open scholarship, uh, depending on what their background is. So far in the series... Uh, we've had books by a philosopher, Adam Miller, by a physician slash theologian, Sam Brown, and now we're adding a, a biologist to this mix. Um, so the question they ask in these books is how does faith and the academy interact with each other? And before I describe the book, I want to um, uh, introduce the author of it, Stephen Peck. He's seated on the front row. He's not actually not going to speak tonight. So if you've been to a Steve Peck event before, you won't have to listen to him this time. Um, but he's an associate professor of biology at BYU. He teaches courses like the history and philosophy of biology and bioethics. His research in theoretical mathematical ecology and insect populations. I don't even know. I'm not sure what that is. Um, but it's really important. It's been recognized by the National Academy of Sciences uh, he's done great work helping, uh, helping to fight um, insect-borne illness. Um, so his work is more than just theoretical. It has real practical implications. Um, he's published in over, over 40 scientific articles and prominent publications like American Naturalist, Newsweek, and Zygon, I think is how you pronounce that one. Uh, it's one of the words you read but never say. Uh, and he's also an author of fiction, the scholar of Moab, A Short Stay in Hell, and, and poems and short stories, and he's a real Renaissance man. Uh, and like many of you, Steve is familiar with uh, the fact that believers and scientists have, have wrestled over the relationship of science and faith uh, for hundreds of years. And um, his book is a challenging witness that both science and faith are indispensable tools that uh, we can use to navigate God's strange and beautiful creation. Uh, the book is a collection of, of essays. Um, some of them are very technical, some of them are more personal, some of them are funny, some of them I'm sure offensive. Uh, and um, <laughs> but, <they> were. Yeah, <laughs> depending on the reader. Yeah. But uh, he touches on all sorts of issues, not just evolution, but uh, the environment, uh, sacred spaces, human consciousness, and other scientific issues. Um, Steve has the mind of a scientist and the soul of a believer and the heart of a wanderer. And I've found that he, he provides welcome companionship for women and men who are still engaging in the unceasing quest for further light and knowledge. And I, I've personally benefited from his work. 
Um, so instead of having Steve read tonight or talk tonight, we thought it would be really cool to give him a treat and give him a break and invite a great panel of, of thoughtful and distinguished scholars to talk a little bit about the book. Each of them have read the book. Uh, George wrote the introduction and um, Jeff and Janie both provided blurbs for the book. So they're going to talk a little bit about the book and about their own um, thoughts about faith and scholarship. So we're first going to hear from George Handley here in the middle. Uh, he's the Associate Dean of Humanities, right, at mm -hmm. BYU. Uh, and he's also a professor in comparative literature, right? Yeah, more or less. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly what you would expect someone who does comparative literature to say to that question. Uh, after that, uh, Janie Bradabaugh. Uh, she's an Associate Professor of Geological Sciences at BYU, and I was speaking with her at dinner tonight about volcanoes and aliens, and that was uh, interesting. <laughs> Alien life, I guess, uh, not the green Martian type. Uh, and then finally, Dwayne Jeffrey, he goes by Jeff. Uh, he's an emeritus professor of biology. Uh, he taught at BYU for years, and it's quite possible, uh, and I say this without hyperbole, that without him it's possible that we wouldn't all be meeting here tonight. So uh, we're really, really glad to have him with us. So each panelist is gonna take 10 or 15 minutes, and then when we're through, we'll open up the room for a couple questions. Hopefully this will last about one hour. We're not going to keep you too long. And Steve's available to sign copies of the book if you've picked up a copy. Um, and I'd also like to say thanks to Brad Kramer and Rit and Vision for uh, hosting the event here. Uh, if you have cell phones, go ahead and uh, turn them on their loudest setting. And uh, <laughs> at events like this, you always get a call from mom, so that'll be nice. Um, but we'll go ahead and start uh, with George Handley. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Blair. And I, I just want to uh, tout the Living Faith series by the Maxwell Institute. I think it's one of the most important uh, developments at the Maxwell Institute in, in, in a very long time. And, and I strongly endorse uh, not only the project, but the, the three books that have already been published and, and the many that I'm sure are to come. Um, and thank you to uh, Brad also for having this event. Um, I, I want to say a couple of things uh, esoteric and um, very mundane about, uh, about Steve's book and about Steve. Um, Steve's a very close friend and, and very, very valued uh, colleague of mine at BYU. And both of us are not blessed with good memories, and we, so we can't really remember when we met. <laughs> uh, although I do have a very distinct memory of talking with Steve outside of the Kennedy Center, and this probably was about 15 years ago. So I'm thinking this might have been when we first met, and I don't re but I don't remember why we were talking. Um, but I remember thinking, wow, this guy is really fun to talk to, and he knows so much, and he's so passionate. And, you know, if you know Steve, you know that he's not only uh, gifted with this very wide-ranging intellect, but um, a, a real deep humility and, and a, a wonderful sense of humor. So... Um, all of that makes uh, working with Steve a great privilege. In fact, I think working with Steve is one of the greatest privileges of my professional career. Um, <laughs> no, really. <laughs> I mean that. <laughs> I know it sounds sincere when people say that's one of the greatest privileges of my professional career, but I really mean it when I say Sorry, that's a paraphrase of Steve Martin. Never mind. Um, <laughs> But, you know, working alongside him, writing and thinking and, and reading uh, and teaching with him, uh, as I've done, has been just an incredible experience. Um, and he's, he's opened up my horizons on so many levels. Um, I, you know, I'm vaguely in comparative literature, as, as Blair already alluded to. And, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I, needed, I needed a lot of help uh, to venture into the sciences and Steve has been has been my guide. He's he's um, he's my Virgil, if you were if you will. But uh, I, I really appreciate the 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 friendship on so many levels. And on a much more uh, broader issue, it's not it's, since this isn't really just about a personal friendship. It, 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 Steve is really you know when you think about great minds in Mormonism that that mean a lot to the to the to us as a people as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm confident in saying that Steve Peck will, will, will become increasingly important in the church. Um, he already is very, very important, um, but he's young, and he's got lots of books still in his head and, and lots of thoughts to share, and so I, I think um, there's, there's plenty more to come. 
Uh, so I really think he's just one of the rarest of individuals that, that the church has ever produced. And I'm going to just um, make him embarrassed for just a little bit longer, and then I'm going to say something esoteric about his book. But um, I wrote a letter f about Steve a number of years ago um, for one of these um, you know, bureaucratic institutional review things. And, and, uh, but it was a real pleasure to write. And this is what, part of what I said. Um, uh, what makes Steve even more impressive are his accomplishments as an essayist, poet, and fiction writer. Keep in mind, this is a review of him as a scientist. I have read his creative work, and as a literary critic, I believe he has published some of the finest work ever to come out of BYU by any creative writer. His scientific background is everywhere evident in his writing, whether it is a poetic reflection on an aspect of the natural world, or in his brilliant novel, The Scholar of Moab, an integration of philosophy, theology, and forestry. You cannot find a mind like his anywhere on this campus and perhaps anywhere in all of Mormondom. His writing has impressed literary scholars and passionate readers outside of the LDS community and at other universities. He would never want to brag about his accomplishments as a writer, nor would he wish to have his creative work substitute for the research he is expected to do as a scientist. But the significance of what he has done and will yet do as a creative writer and broad interdisciplinary thinker, which I think includes these essays, um, should not be treated lightly in the assessment of his contributions. He has blessed the lives and built the faith of countless students, but also of countless others who have long since graduated who are simply part of the broader Mormon conversation. Through his many outreach efforts, many have come to see him as an indispensable example of passion for life, faith in the gospel, intellectual curiosity, and maybe just as importantly, good and self-deprecating humor. He inspires others to learn and respect science to, and to reach out beyond the comfort of their own disciplines and worldviews, even as he allows us to see how wonderful and inclusive of truth the restored gospel is. Because of his unique and much needed abilities, I don't think it is hyperbolic to say that he is one of the most valuable professors to ever worked at this institution. Um, so there's that. Uh, <laughs> now Steve is red, and that's good. So what I want to say is about, is about um, I, I wrote a preface for this book. I thought I could just read it, and then I wouldn't have to do any extra prep work, but you can read it on your own uh, free time. Um, but I, I wanted to say something about the connection between Steve's philosophical writings and his fiction. And one of the things I say in the foreword has to do with the, the way in which these essays are really about speculation. Um, they're, uh, they're methods of experimentation, and I think, uh, or, or methods of seeing the world otherwise, right? To, to tease out multiple possibilities out of an otherwise singular view of the world or a singular reality. And that is both very uh, artistic and also very scientific is, is the point I wanna make. Um, if you're lucky enough to be friends on Facebook with him, sorry, Steve, this is now you're going to get like a hundred requests. Um, I'll take it. He, he's, he, he's easy. He doesn't have any discrimination. He'll take any. Uh, Steve has, has written, a, uh, he says about 20 posts about Pleasant Grove and they are hysterically funny and I won't elaborate on them, but they're basically experiments in how to make Pleasant Grove an interesting place to live. Um, <laughs> which is a bit like, you know, sort of doing a scientific experiment to see what the deeper reality behind the appearance of things might be. Um, but you, you can certainly see this sort of experimentation in A Short Stay in Hell and in, a, in Scholar of Moab, right? I mean, when he first described to me the plot of Scholar of Moab, I was really fearful for his future. I thought, and I was embarrassed to admit, too embarrassed to admit to him at the time that it sounded like a very, very bad idea to write this novel. Um, uh, but I absolutely loved it when I read it precisely because of the way in which it convinced me of its veracity in its experimentations, right? And so what he achieves is a kind of re-entry into the ordinary and the known that makes the world come alive with possibility that otherwise might seem boring or mundane or even confining in some way. And this, of course, is the kind of experience that a scientist has with the world, since science can unveil an otherwise hidden reality and distort the meaning of what we thought we knew or what was routinized or familiar to us. And this isn't, I should say, you know, some, some sort of bad fantastical fiction really is a function of being impatient with the world, right, with what is, what is real. And it's not that at all with Steve. There's a, there's a kind of faithful wondering about what is, right, and, and faithful probing of what, um, 
the present is in its in its full richness, right? And it's wonderfully in its wonderful complexity. Um, and and what's so wonderful about this is that science uh, and religion and and the humanities uh, can all harden into very predictable and uh, dogmatic certainties about reality. And and it's exactly that dogmatism that he's he's uh, constantly fighting against and um, um, sort of t turning the soils of to uh, conceal, to, to, to reveal uh, new realities rather than conceal them, which is what dogmatism often tends to do. And of course, this, this was iterated uh, very beautifully by Elder Nelson when he dedicated the Life Sciences Building at BYU where he talked about where there are conflicts between science and religion. It's usually because either science or religion or both need to rethink their assumptions, which I think is a really beautiful uh, point of view. So what you get in Steve is really a powerful ethos uh, that, that prizes wonder and surprise and openness, and that which wishes uh, to always experiment on the word uh, or on reality, And like, as I say. And that seems to be, I think, both the scientific dimension to his fictional experiments and the fictional dimension to his science. Of course, I've never actually watched him do his science, uh, so I can't really speak to that, but but I know that that's um, uh, you know what, what what he does, and and I and I think what's fascinating is that you know for Steve, um, he never takes science or religion or fiction too seriously, but he also takes them utterly seriously. They are always important and uh, to be, and almost everything is at stake, and yet there is a sense in which. Um, because it needs constant experimentation, that there is a kind of joyful play in, in, in um, the process that I think is just wonderfully evident in everything he writes, whether it's philosophy uh, or fiction or poetry uh, or children's writing, which I haven't read. Sorry, Steve. Read that. Um, I'm going to read two quotes that I think I'll end with that uh, re relate to this idea of, of surprise and wonder and openness. The first is from the Pope Francis from his recent encyclical on the climate and the environment. He says, if we approach nature and the environment without this openness to awe and wonder, if we no longer speak the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship with the world, our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs. By contrast, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, then sobriety and care will end up spontaneously, will well up spontaneously. I love that. I'll say that again. By contrast, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, then sobriety and care will well up spontaneously. The poverty and austerity of St. Francis were no mere veneer of asceticism, but something much more radical, a refusal to turn reality into an object simply to be used and controlled. And again, you can really sense that that's, that's what Steve's, uh, all of his writing is really trying to do, is to resist that temptation to turn reality into an object. And the other, the other thing I want to read is, is an interview that happened between the daughter of Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, uh, whose name is now escaping me. Is it Catherine Bateson? Uh, and Krista Tippett on on, uh, on Being, the wonderful radio program. Krista Tippett, and, and Bateson is, is, is a Catholic, and her father was a famous atheist, and Margaret Mead was, of course, a famous anthropologist. And so she, her own journey is very fascinating. But I, I, I want to end with this because I think, again, this captures um, what you find in Steve's essays. So Krista Tippett says this to her. Let me ask you this, this large question, what does it mean to be human? which is a philosophical question, it's a theological question, and it's an anthropological question. It's a question your mother, Margaret Mead, and your father, Gregory Bateson, were asking. I know it's also a huge question. How would you start to talk about your sense of that as it has evolved in the course of this life you've lived? Perhaps in, in ways that have taken you by surprise or not. So this is a wonderful setting for her answer, which again, I want to stress, is echoed in Steve's essays. She says the following, I was going to give you an excessively intellectual answer about having to do with consciousness. And you made it a much more personal question. Consciousness is important. Reflection is important. Thinking about what you're doing and what it means and the search for meaning. 
One of the things that I came to believe when I wrote that piece you referred to about my father's death is that death is a very important part of life that we shouldn't deny. That in spite of our terrible hubris and greed and competitiveness, that we can learn to see ourselves in proportion and realize that we're small and temporary and don't understand as much as we need to. Again, these are themes echoed throughout Steve's essays. And we live in a time of real urgency where we have to mine the insights of the past. I guess one way of saying it is we have to learn to use the word we to include all life on earth. We have to learn to experience that as a terrible and tender beauty and shape everything we do to protect it. Uh, so I just end with that quote because I think that em encapsulates what you'll find in Steve's essays. There's a great sense of ethical urgency that run throughout the essays at the same time that there's this playful and joyous uh, speculation and wonder in the face of, of what we've been given in this creation. Thank you. To all in the village I seemed, no doubt, to go this way and that way, aimlessly. But here by the river you can see at twilight, the soft-winged bats fly zigzag here and there. They must fly so to catch their food. And if you have ever lost your way at night in the deep wood near Miller's Ford, and dodged this way and now that, wherever the light of the Milky Way shone through, trying to find the path, you should understand I sought the way with earnest zeal, and all my wanderings were wanderings in the quest. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy this opening quote from the book. Um, it's from the Spoon River Anthology. And I, I just like the idea that it emphasizes wanderings. And uh, immediately, as I opened the book, I felt a, a real kinship with Steve um, and, and the fact that he, he really uh, identified with exploring um, it all began for him as, as uh, wandering around in his natural environment as a boy and uh, becoming introduced to all it had to offer him in uh, the Red Rock Canyons of Moab and, uh, and Canyonlands. And he says in the introduction, I'm reading a fair amount from this, there's just so much good stuff. So, uh, <laughs> We had the whole of Canyonlands to explore. The hills that surround Moab rise steeply from the valley floor, and on the other side of those were endless canyons, caves, and roads waiting for youthful adventurers. My friends and I would regularly sling a sleeping bag over our shoulder and ramble into the cold desert without a map or compass and walk until dark. And we'd throw our bedrolls onto the sand and call it a camp. In the morning, we would continue wending our way up into unexplored canyons. From time to time, we found Anasazi petroglyphs scratched into the desert patina of rock walls varnished by long action of wind and rain. And he talks about running into boxes of dynamite and mines, and I guess that didn't end too badly, so. <laughs> um, and he mentions that on those excursions, our imaginations were fired with tales of alien abductions, Anasazi ghosts, and visits to distant stars. I think it's just so compelling and beautiful to think about how uh, these beginnings of, of being a wanderer, uh, where they occurred, and, and his passion for them. And, uh, and then I think it's also interesting that he's wandering his way through science and uh, this idea that we actually can be explorers uh, through science and uh, to think about how we can approach new problems and go down unexplored paths and, uh, and seek the road not traveled uh, so that we can better understand and, and shed light on the problems that we have that we face. Um, I've, I've felt a little bit too my, my own need to wander and in my scientific pursuits um, I literally wander and uh, part of it is that I, I would really like to wander out into outer space but it turns out to be very difficult to uh, find yourself standing on the surface of the moon and uh, only 12 people have done this <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, because it's so hard to do that we're, we're kind of doing it virtually aren't we we're sending out spacecraft into the outer reaches of the solar system and, uh, and, and in that way we all are able to explore other bodies and we're finding that um, we can all be involved, we can all share and some small part in this um, and be very excited by all the new discoveries. I was, I was really impressed by how uh, motivated everyone was by the flybys of Pluto this past summer. I mean, 
everybody was so excited to see to see us just uh, screaming past this tiny little body that we'd never seen before and everybody kind of felt like they were there in some way or another right so so that's really exciting but i still felt like there's a real exciting um, part about actually physically wandering to some place and so where could i wander and how can i learn about these places in, in some way um, and so, so I'm actually becoming kind of a, obnoxious to some of my friends and saying, you know, you can go to Kauai on your own time, but I need you to go to the western desert of Australia with me now <laughs> so that we can see this sand dune that nobody's seen before and try to understand what's going on. So um, they're all telling me to back off a little bit and, and uh, <laughs> wait for a little while. So, so anyway, I'm um, trying to get to these places that, that are uh, not very well understood, not very well explored, because... Um, in that way, we can see something new that no one's seen before and try to understand these processes in, in some way that, that is not understood yet. Um, then I think the other, the other interesting aspect of this book, not only the, uh, the idea of exploring his way through science, is also um, l letting this love of, of nature and wild places also inform his religious faith. He's mentioned this here. I've written about my wanderings through the strange and exciting canyons of science and faith. Um, and that we can actually use exploration as, as a means to understand our own spirituality is really interesting. Um, and, and so now back to this idea of how we, we can explore. Uh, it feels like we kind of need a, a, a physical self to be able to do that, even spiritually, which is kind of interesting. And, and in that sense, Mormon theology really embraces that because we've talked so much about the importance of embodiment in Mormon theology. And uh, he mentions in chapter three, in Mormon thought, God is embodied. And it's not completely clear what that means, but it implies at least in some sense that God has a biology. What such a biology might entail is quite speculative, but indicates the human capacity for a bodily theosis which recapitulates God's developmental process, if not completely in scope, at least in such a way that can be considered human beings' movement toward becoming godlike. So this idea that we have a body and that we are able to, at the same time, um, embrace our spiritual selves and, and in that way approach becoming like God is, is uh, really special to our, to our faith. And he describes this really well in this book. Um, and in fact, we place a lot of importance on the idea that we need to, to get a body. And, and then that means that we're part of our material world, right? And we're part of all of our surroundings, part of all those um, beings and creatures that came before us as well. Um, and he quotes Jim Falconer, who says, Our experience of the body, the only standard we have for understanding embodiment, suggests that God is affected by the world and by persons in the world. And, and so that's a really fascinating idea. If God has a body, then he's part of this, maybe you could even say universe, right? And, uh, and once we start studying the universe, we realize that it is quite small and has not been around for very long. That might seem like a complete contradiction to what we really do understand, but you can place a number on it, 14 billion years, right? And we can see the edges of it. And so maybe God is in that universe as well. Um, and so that's really interesting that that places us in this world and in fact um, reminds us that we rose up from its darkest corners, right? Some remote part of the earth was our origin. That's where we came from. Um, or maybe another planet. That's another thing we can talk about. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and so then if we really decide, desire to wander off into these undiscovered parts, maybe that's understandable. We're kind of returning to our roots in some way. Um, and maybe our desire for exploration outside the world is, again, uh, some way a return to our origins as well. We're trying to figure this out. Where did we come from? Where did life start? And so, so maybe we were even brought here by some uh, interplanetary wanderer, by some stray asteroid. And so maybe we want to go back out there and see, see where it is we came from. And so if we're drawn to these places that are very remote, like the, the solar system, like um, a place like Antarctica, I'll... I'll all places that are, are completely devoid of life might also kind of speak to us about our intelligence, okay? Because that must transcend any biological urge. Why would we want to go to a place that's absolutely sterile, okay? Unless it's that, that we just want to understand what, uh, what, where we come, came from and what those places are like. 
Um, so while Steve's wanderings helped connect him to the biology and the origin of life, um, I think mine have connected me to the landscape and the origin of the planets. And uh, we both seek truth and to be off the beaten path in some way. Um, and I've read this quote from Carl Sagan a lot lately, but I think it's a really nice idea. Uh, we were wanderers from the beginning. Even though we've generally abandoned the nomadic life, the sedentary life has left us edgy, unfulfilled. Even after 400 generations in villages and cities we haven't forgotten, the open road still softly calls like a nearly forgotten song of childhood. We are drawn by a craving we can hardly articulate or understand to undiscovered lands and new worlds. So maybe I could clip this thing on. Maybe we can. Will that work all right for you folks upstairs in outer darkness? <laughs> I thought I would like to try to maybe explore a little bit the historical setting in, in which I think Steve's book falls and fits and why I find this important for, for society in general, religions in general, Mormons specifically. I, I would like to start with some data from a number of years ago by a psychologist who wrote a paper on the, the social origins of American scientists and scholars. Uh, he asked himself the question, how can we explore the cultural values that, that make for the production of science and scientists and scholars that are so critical that are so critical in, in, our, in our everyday life. And so he took the following approach. He said, Suppose I were to look at all the schools, the various churches to which the you know, people belong, the states from which they come, and ask the question, of those who graduate from college, what percentage of those go on to the terminal degree in their individual fields, to the doctorate level, you know, the ones who do the usual moving and shaking for any given field? He broke this down by religions, by states, by characteristics of, of of both of those and ended up with a number of cultural values that he associated with high or low productivity of scientists and scholars. Uh, Steve's book really impinges on, on a lot of these. So let me, let me say that uh, he gives a chart of high productivity and the qualities associated with those and low productivity of the culture and items associated with those. For high productivity, he says, there must be a belief in naturalism, a belief that the world is a world of order and law and pattern and meaning. Low productivity, on the other hand, believes that the world is unknowable and incomprehensible, that events are capricious, they're mysterious, they're whimsical. Deity may understand, but humans never can. Secondly, there's an intrinsic value for high productivity of learning and a value of knowledge. Whereas, on the other hand, there's a suspicion of learning and education, a constricted value of learning and anti-intellectualism. I would like each of you to think as we're, as we're reviewing these, where does your particular culture and faith happen to fit? My students in the past have felt like they were bouncing from high to low to high to low. And uh, maybe that gives us something we ought to try to work on if we think that we ought to be more productive. Um, <clears throat> high productivity respects the dignity of human beings. There's optimism concerning man's ability to discover truth and change his world. Low productivity disparages humanity and says that man is powerless at the mercy of fate and destiny and luck and chance. He is evil, incompetent. And you might say, well, I haven't heard of any of those. Uh, look around, they're there. <laughs> uh, there is a, a personal dedication for high productivity, a seriousness of purpose, sense of mission, responsibility beyond the family. Low productivity believes that there is a sense of indirection. You've got to take and enjoy what's available now 
And there is high loyalty to family and kin. Play with that one a bit. For high productivity, there's a sense of equalitarianism, active promotion of causes to improve the status of the disadvantaged, high regard and status for women and children, and pacifism. Whereas low productivity is very authoritarian based. Reliance on authority, power relationships are important. The patriarchal, or, patriarchal order gives male dominance, their aggressiveness, and militarism. Those are low qualities. Then there's a sense of anti-traditionalism. High productivity is related with people not being satisfied with the established way of doing things. There's the restless, wandering spirit. For traditional, however, or for low productivity, the past is respected. You're very traditional. You romanticize the group's history. This leads to low productivity. And lastly, high productivity is centered on the near future. Concerned with this world, orientation toward the foreseeable future, whereas low productivity is centered on the distant and uh, present and the distant future, you hope for a better break in the distant future and in the next life. If I were to ask you, can you think of specific relig religions that fall into the high category or the low category? Could we do that? I think it would make an interesting discussion. <laughs> But he breaks them down into five groups. Highly productive, productive, fairly productive, low productivity, and very low productivity. Highly productive religions are Quakers, Unitarians, secularized Jews. Next level down, productive are the Church of the Brethren, Mormons, Reformed Christians, Congregationals. And he says their qualities are moderately liberal. <laughs> uh, they're dissidents, anti-traditional Protestants, etc. Fair productivity are the, the northern congregations, particularly for Protestants, Methodists, and Baptists. He's using data here from 1920 to 1961. So he's, he's restricting this only to white graduates of, of college because it would be rather unfair... To, to mix in some of the other ethnic groups. Low productivity are the Southern Protestants, Disciples of Christ, and Lutherans, Fundamentalist, Conservative Protestants. And very low productivity, Roman Catholic. Hmm. Now, I would suggest that if you were to repeat this, you'd find Catholicism has moved up greatly because of a change in some of these characters that we asked, that we, that we reviewed. Well, he goes on to, to review states in which states were more productive for the physical sciences, biological sciences, social sciences, arts and professions, and for education. And it then gives you the fields combined in which states were you know, most productive. The most productive state, far and away, higher above number two then number two is above number 26. What would you pick? 1920 to 1961. Utah. Utah had that incredible lead over everybody else. But I have talked with that gentleman and asked him if he was going to update that, this, this work, and he said, well, he had data through the 1970s to about 1975 or so but he could never publish it because you can no longer get religions of scholars anymore the way you could. You know, you used to be able to open up, you know, the American men and women of science and it gave their religion. That's not done anymore. So he said he can't do that, but he said he did have enough data to indicate which states had moved and which had not. Utah had lost that incredible lead that it had through the 60s and 70s. Massachusetts had come from the top. In the 1920s, it was about number 20, then it moved to number 6 in the 1960s and so on. But it was at the top, and that was, Utah was still number one if you looked only at males. For females, we were 36. For males and females together, that put us into second place. 
Well, why would Massachusetts move up? Why would Utah go down? I'll let you play with those on your own. I had some good discussions with the gentleman who did these data. And he said, well, he thought, he thought that after the 1960s, the Eastern snobby colleges, prestigious schools, started recruiting the better students from all across the country. And so they were robbing the other states of their better students. I said, well, what would you say about the change towards science in Mormonism? He didn't want to go there. <laughs> ah, he was Mormon. Uh, but I thought it might be well, and Steve reviews a bit of this in chapter 3 of his book, that in the early 1900s, BYU lost the first three PhDs it ever had. In the history of the Chamberlain brothers and the Peterson brothers, uh, one, of the, one of the Chamberlain brothers did not have a PhD, he had a master's in philosophy, but he was very, very bright. But we got in an argument over how to interpret scriptures and evolution. And we lost all three of those first PhDs and eventually William Chamberlain too. Steve reviews this in chapter three. I would, I would leave that for your reading. Um, how are we doing on time here? We're running out. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think the, uh, the point needs to be made that religion is inherently conservative. You take the teachings of whoever founded the faith or whoever has given it articulation, guidance, and direction, and you defend those, oft times with your very life. Um, it's far easier for writers who try to discuss any religion in light of their modern science or modern, modern culture to defend the faith. That's easy. It's when you suggest changes that it gets hard. And those who are digging in their heels will question the other person's commitment to the faith. In Mormonism, we'd say, oh, I worry about your testimonies. Uh, I've heard one person that was said, uh, well, he's, he's taking, his, he's, he's going too far beyond his stewardship. Nice phrase. Um, the, um, and, so, and so there's always this, there's suspicion of anyone who tries to suggest a new way to go. Steve deals with this and does it very nicely. But there's a real irony here for Mormons. And that is, there's the story of how Moroni came to Joseph Smith and he quoted a whole bunch of scripture. And the last one that was specifically identified was from Joel 2, Chapters 28 to 31 from the Old Testament. Do you remember that one? Sure, we all learned that one. No. <laughs> We've all read it. But Joel says, In the last days, this, my spirit will be, the Lord says, In the last days, my spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. Your old men shall dream dreams. That fits, doesn't it? It happens, believe me. As I get older, I understand that. <laughs> Your young men shall see visions, etc. And he said, this has not come to pass, but it shortly will. What did he mean by that? How do we interpret Joel 2.28? Why don't we have it in our lesson manuals today? For the first 120 years of Mormonism, that was interpreted as the rise of science. Your young men shall see dreams and so on. I remember getting little cards, you know, be truthful to you, be true to yourself when I was a kid. And one of them featured, you know, a young man doing science experiments and built the whole thing on Joel and Moroni. But that changed, didn't it? I often refer to Joel and Moroni as Mormonism's forgotten scriptures. Beginning in the 1950s, 54, 58 to be precise, we had some very influential books published that were very anti-science. And they swung the whole church to that point of view. Please read chapter 3 in Steve's book and get a little bit of background against which that played. But the point was that we had had very prominent scientists in the Quorum of the Twelve, James E. Talmage, uh, John A. Witso come to mind, B.H. Roberts was the president of the 70, and very, very uh, uh, well-versed on... Uh, he's a forerunner of Steve Peck, frankly. But... Um, 
All those were there and they were prominent and those scientists spoke out. In 1931 there was a big doctrinal debate of things and um, the first presidency said to everybody, leave these issues alone, we don't have the answers. Um, and, and the scientists pretty well observed that dictum. The anti-science people did not. John A. Widsow, the last science and the scientist in the 12 in those days, died in 1952 and November. And in the April conference of 54, Marion G. Romney broke, the, broke the, the agreement. And that's where the anti-science stuff began in the church. Why is this having so much trouble? I got it too close to that. It's too close to me, that's the problem. The, um, <laughs> so there's, <laughs> there's uh, events in life are capricious and only God knows why they happen. <laughs> Um, well, the, the story of Moroni and Joel gives a wonderful background for Mormons to work on, but we have forgotten that. And I think it's time to get back to that. Steve's book is a major trend toward that. We've had a number of books that try to say, look, the church does not have the anti-evolution stance that everybody thinks it does. In 1992, Rex Lee, president of BYU, took a series of collections to the Brethren in Salt Lake and said, do these summarize the church's official position on evolution? And they said, yes, they do. And you can get the so-called BYU packet. It's been published in a few places, not, not really like it should be. But uh, it really leaves things pretty open. That's the official church view. Steve then does more than review that. Steve gives us new ways to approach the issues of trying to synthesize. He summarizes various ways that people have done it and then tries to turn that to a Mormon point of view as well. He ranges all the way from the existence or from the, from the emergence of human, of, of life, to the meaning of death. Um, it's a wide-ranging book. The um, the evidence for evolution these days is absolutely overwhelming from every field of science you want to mention. As Henry Eyring, the chemist, used to say, you can tell people the earth is flat for only so long. And then they start to question everything you want to tell them. It's time we embrace that reality. That you can no longer be taking the position that some of the evangelical Christians do. It's just not defensible. Steve gives us new categories, new ways of trying to to move toward that direction and I can only thank the Maxwell Institute for publishing his book and helping people to have these ideas more readily available. And I'll quit there. Um, I wanted to give Steve a minute to say a couple words too and I should also say tomorrow Steve's going to be on Radio West with Doug Brizio. Uh, on uh, we are 90.1. <laughs> so, look, looking forward to that too. But we'll let Steve take a couple I, I, I just wanted to refute everything that's been said. <laughs> uh, no, I, this, 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 if I have any talent at all, it's because I surround myself with great people. I mean, seriously. Uh, these are all my friends. They've had a tremendous influence on my, on, in my life and, and I'm not going to get mushy so I'll shut up. But they really, they really have. I, I, I'm so grateful that uh, I can surround myself with people of, of this quality and, and thought and, and doing such amazing things in the world and out of the world. <laughs> uh, and I, and I also, I wanted to say one thing. Um, if you open the book, you'll see it's dedicated to the Waters family. And they've blessed my own in so many ways. And they're here. I don't know where, but if they, if they could stand up, I'll, maybe they left. Oh, they're here. <laughs> stand up, Jill. <laughs> they, they've been great friends from the time I have a, 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 a graduate school. They helped all my kids go on their missions. I mean, they were, they were just, they, they've been really, really influential in everything. So this, this book was 
dedicated to them. Um, they're helping with my kids' mission it meant that I didn't have to work as a Walmart greeter so I could write. So, <laughs> thank uh, but but thanks for coming. I'm 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 grateful that you're uh, you're here, and I I hope you find the book useful. And and, and thanks to Blair too. Blair Blair edited this, and I was at a I was at a I was on a, on the phone with a, a bunch of other people, several of who had acted as my editor, and they began to talk about how impossible I am to edit. <laughs> and and uh, so give give Blair a chance. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. You can learn more about Stephen Peck's new book at bit.ly slash evolvingfaith. We'll be back next time with more interviews on the Maxwell Institute podcast.